Um, I think that um, you would agree with me that we've had some very interesting presentations, which has shown us that everything in the end is built in steps, and that wherever we may be in terms of the development of our individual legal aid systems, that we need to just continue to take those steps, even if they are slowly but surely, we need to take them and develop effective legal aid systems at a national level, because I think that comes through from all the presentations, <coughs> which is able to provide a service to the poor and the vulnerable. And it's interesting that the different experiences all show us the same thing, and that from those we can learn how we can take our next step, whatever that may be. In the end, I think that there are certain common things which have been spoken about even in the last session, um, about how we can guarantee such a scheme or not, and building on that, what then um, at a practical level is essential to move forward. Key in that is the commitment from government and funding from government to ensure that uh, poor people are able to access justice. So I think that whether we look at it in terms of um, Somaliland and um, Myanmar, who are at different stages of development, or in terms of Eastern Europe and where they started from and where they are at now. And then the pitfalls of legislation and how that can undo very good intentions, we have things that we can draw on from each of the presentations. Having said that, I would invite questions and comments from the floor. We have um, half an hour till 3.30, so we have a bit of time and we will then um, take the comments and I'll take a few, well three at a time, and then get our panelists to respond and then we'll move to the next. So let me start from that side. Uh, Steve Tucson from the Pitts University uh, Law Clinic. I'd just like to make a comment on uh, Zaza's presentation on the point uh, lessons learned. And I want to draw from our own experience. In a, we have a partnership agreement with Legal Aid South Africa, a university law clinic partnering with Legal Aid. And what, one of the strong points, I think, of Legal Aid South Africa is the insistence on keeping good statistics. Because we have to fill in forms about gender, types of cases, area, time, how long a case takes, what a lot of information is required for reporting back to our partner. And I think that this data, you, you mentioned Zaza that there was a total lack of data in the beginning. And this can be used to inform policy making, to persuade government, to persuade stakeholders that it works, it's a good idea, it can be cost effective. So I would just urge people starting out to start off with a, a culture of keeping good data and statistics because it really does pay dividends in the future. Okay, anyone else on that side? There's a hand on the side. Okay, there's a hand on that on my extreme left. Okay, and then I'll come to you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Rizna, I'm from UNDP Maldives. Um, Question to uh, regarding Zaza's presentation um, uh, on the lessons learned part. Um, you mentioned about um, the benefits of having a single legal aid management entity with some sort of um, uh, independence, some sort of uh, some degree of independence. Um, what, what were the type of challenges or what type of uh, issues did you fa uh, you saw in, in in the study of the countries that you mentioned in the presentation? where you had uh, multiple entities uh, handling the issue of legal aid. Thank you. In this question here. My name is uh, Ivy Ashton. I'm an attorney from Chicago. <coughs> and I was just kind of struck by all of the great um, presentations, but never once was the word technology mentioned. It seems to me that one of the things that we ought to be thinking about as we move forward, not just for the collection of data, which I totally agree is a, a great thing to have and can influence policy, but from an efficiency standpoint, um, systems 
that will help uh, reduce the barriers to access to justice, things like document automation or video conferencing, or just um, you know web portals that have information to, to distribute information easily throughout throughout the internet and things like that. I just was wondering if you could speak at all about the technology that you're seeing or contemplating. I'm just going to get the panelists to respond to that, and in the meantime, you can think of more questions. Maybe you want to start with you, Zazie. Yeah, Mike, that we can use for <laughs> Yes, um, no, there was a comment about uh, the, 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 really the, the Building or creating culture of monitoring and, and data collection, and I was I was really struck. Uh, the, the, you know, the, I worked with um, um, uh, Ed Cape and uh, Roger Smith in a room um, uh, on a study on effective criminal defense in Europe. So we looked at eight EU member states. Uh, the report was published in 2010. Um, um, it included uh, France, uh, England, uh, uh, Germany. In Italy, so on so forth, so like uh, the Belgium, uh, few East European countries. So we, so I thought that in Eastern Europe, in the post-communist countries, so we don't have that culture of data and then monitoring and then governments don't have capacity. But you know, I, I was really shocked to discover that actually in Western European countries, you know, we couldn't find any data, like very little to nothing, almost. So the report actually we put forward turned out to be one of the very first uh, of the kind to really address the question of. Like a state of legal aid, uh, so it was uh, quite a <laughs> surprise to me. But it seems that probably the, this is a field where actually the, the, the needs are tremendous, and you know everywhere, almost places. Um, the uh, question of technology, um, uh, absolutely, it's uh, um, you know there's a really uh, impressive effort. Uh, I couldn't cover many things in my presentation, but for example, in Ukraine. They created uh, last year a 24-hour duty lawyer model. It's a, it's a country of 40 something million people. It's a large territory. They, they created a kind of a call-in center, one national number, and then a mechanism through which the lawyers are identified and dispatched. You know, within an hour or so, kind of to every place where the police person may be detained. So they, without that technology, this cannot kind of work. And, Absolutely. So this was essential to make that um, uh, thing work. On, on the question on the legal aid uh, management bodies, this probably was, you know, one of the most difficult. Uh, I have uh, kind of the kind of a, the, the point to really get the buy-in from the governments and. You know, the, the, so probably in every country I, I listed here, just you know, where reforms uh, succeeded in some ways in Eastern Europe. Uh, so the, the, you know, the, the, the in, you know, the one one of the ways in which we succeeded in convincing them uh, why this is important, it's just not enough, of course, me or someone else telling them or even bringing books or studies. We took them to legal aid board. So the working groups that were created by those governments to elaborate on legal aid laws. We actually, all the countries that I talked about came to South Africa. So to, because I thought that, you know, if they meet Justice Mambo, meet the staff, and they hear from them why this is important, they probably maybe get convinced. So they also, there are not many examples of legal aid boards or this type of emergency structures in Europe, but there is a good one in uh, Netherlands, really good one in Scotland, so we also use the, their models. Uh, and so they kind of really try to, Use, you know, you build data, you provide information, but for, for politicians to create a new bureaucracy, new structure, kind of uh, to ask again for additional, you know, kind of the money for that, it's kind of not a, not a kind of a go kind of thing or very attractive. Um, uh, then you have the bar association, so I didn't mention in my presentation, but in almost most countries, in Eastern Europe, but as well as outside of Eastern Europe, where I worked on uh, legal aid reforms. Almost exclusively, without any exception, I don't have any experience of otherwise. The bar associations have been really either entirely against the legal aid reforms of this kind, or have not been collaborated. They saw this as a competition or take away their competence. So it's kind of the building consensus for um, kind of uh, the you know the, the, the convincing the, the, the policymakers why it is more efficient and more important. 
to, to, to really create this management structure. In some places, quasi independent, in other places, fully independent, like South Africa. I think it's the, it's the, it's the essential element for any legal aid reform for it to succeed. Okay, just I want to comment on all three very briefly. The one from our Vitz colleague, just to say getting statistics is very important and universities can play a role in doing this and you can use law students and people as resources to go and observe what's going on in the courts and all that sort of thing. A good thing to do as well is to run a pilot project on what you're trying to do and show what, what happens in the pilot project if you're trying to work, cost, work out costs and things as well. It's a very useful way, and donors often will assist you with that if you're trying to set up a pilot project, you build up a nice database, and then you can extrapolate from that. The, the question from our colleagues from the Maldives in terms of independence, one of the difficulties we had with quite a lot of countries, and I remember this, I think, is where you've had the previous system and you've had very tight state control over the thing, there's often a reluctance to hand it over. The ministries of justice or somebody want to keep this thing. They don't want to make it independent. Very often we use the analogy of a human rights commission or something like that that you've got in your country which can be state funded but independent. So one needs to look at that because for credibility, for your credibility, it is not good for credibility if they think that you are prosecuting and defending the state. If they don't see defense lawyers being separate from the same guys who are prosecuting them. Lastly, just on the IT, very important. Um, in a lot of the developing countries, not so available but increasingly so. Legal Aid South Africa is a very sophisticated IT setup in it if anybody wants to go and see that. But also to say, link with this, they have a telephone advice system where you can phone in and get preliminary advice and be referred to um, lawyers if you need them and so on as well. So there's a lot to be said for that as well. And cell phones now, people are using cell phones instead of computers so people can access information through the cell phones. Thank you. Um, any more questions? Comments? Okay. <coughs> Professor Kruger, yeah, anyone else on this side? Okay, good. There's more hands coming up on that side. Can you start with you, Philip? Uh, I'm Philippa Kruger from Bits Law Clinic. Um, my question or comment is directed uh, to David in particular, and um, the principles and guidelines refer to the use of university law clinics, students, um, and paralegals. And yet there's a great persistence on the part of lawyers to um, make use of paralegals and the student practice rule, for example, which could expand access to justice. Um, so. And, and that it goes in the face of, the, of, of lawyers in private practice who are reluctant to get involved in legal aid work. So you have lawyers who don't want to do legal aid but will keep paralegals and other interested and dedicated stakeholders out. So I, I just want to know, perhaps from any member of the panel, how we could overcome this particular problem. Okay, there's a hand there. In front, I'll just I'll move through the room, so don't don't be worried that I'm going to miss out on you. There was a hand in front yes. here. Yes, uh, thank you. My uh, concern is with regards to the presentation of Mr. Paul on his Somaliland experience, especially given the fact that uh, I'm from a country Nigeria that also have been through a conflict situation. Uh, we talk about the uh, a bill that is now before uh, the legislature, but besides listing certain, which I think was certain uh, roadblocks that could come up to stop this legislation, like funding, he did his presentation fell short of saying or of giving some uh, uh, instances where. Uh, that we, have, we, we could have concrete or convincing answers to give to the legislature when you know the, the bill is being uh, 
debated in the in Congress or in their legislature, at least to give us some experience as to how to build up a case also in case some of these questions or issues arise from the uh, bill being put before the legislature. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else on that side? Okay, let's get the response to those two and then we can move to this next next block. Um, okay. okay. Thanks, Filippo, for, for that question. Um, one of the, I, th I think again, and it's what Zaza said, you need to get statistics. I'll give you one example. I won't mention the country I might have mentioned already, where you had a lay magistrate who had six months diploma. You had a police prosecutor who had a three month diploma. It was a grade four magistrate's court. No lawyers ever appear in a grade four magistrate court. The magistrate could sentence people up to one year in prison. We then suggested, why not have a paralegal defender who would have a year's diploma, more than these other guys, and the Bar Association said, no, you can't have, only lawyers can represent, but they don't go there and represent. So we need to build up a database and say, in these courts, their lawyers not appear. If you guys are prepared to go into a cooperation agreement with a legal aid organization or your national body, and go and defend in those things, okay. But if you guys are not prepared to do that, we've got to think of alternatives. So you've got to show what is happening, because what the president of Sierra Leone told me really struck a chord. They had a huge problem there, because people out in the areas just felt they were completely ignored, or they were at the mercy of the police and the prosecutors. Thanks. Thank you. If I could add to that, I think it's possible, or one could probably say that very often the organized legal profession will not be able to provide all the legal aid services that are required in a particular country uh, for various reasons. Uh, and therefore, it is absolutely important to make use of law clinic students or paralegals. And when I say that, I don't mean that one should say that they can do everything that a fully fledged lawyer can do. But I think they can uh, offer a very good service, especially in the crucial first 48 hours of detention, where lawyers are simply not available, it's over a weekend or whatever the case may be. And uh, people who have been trained to do a specific job, I'm sure will be able to greatly alleviate the strains that we have in our legal system because there is no legal representation. Uh, then the next question, uh, do you want to add something? Obviously. Okay. The question from our colleague in Liberia, the question of what are the arguments that we can uh, offer to legislatures to, uh, to enact legislation? I think uh, the, the principles and guidelines themselves set out a number of those particular provisions. Now, we are fortunate in Somaliland because the constitution itself enshrines the right. So that is argument number one. But I think uh, it is perhaps good for all of us to become advocates of legal aid as being part and parcel of a fair uh, system of justice. Because we need to understand that legal aid is not only there for the benefit of the single detained person, but it bef benefits society as a whole. And I've been told that there are studies in individual countries showing or uh, indicating that there's actually a financial benefit in providing legal aid, uh, in that you don't have long periods of incarceration that, that will result in otherwise, and those kinds of things. But I think the, the main argument is, in a just and fair legal system, the right, of, uh, uh, the right to legal aid is just as important as, say for instance, the independence of the judiciary. So I think one, one will have to develop those arguments actively promote them when legislatures debate uh, the questions of legal aid. I think uh, if, if I'll come back to that, at the end, I'm going to give others a chance to, to add to it because I just want to get all those comments in and then we can come back. Okay, if you bear with me. Um, there were lots of hands on this side, yes. Can we start at the back there and then JP? And then there were a few hands. Okay, that's yeah, fine. You I'm can Alan Lieberman from the uh, New York Civil Liberties Union, which is part of the ACLU. And actually, my, you read my mind, um, but I want to add to what you said with regard to um, documenting the costs of failing to provide for 
adequate um, legal aid services for people who stand accused. Um, you know, for us in this room, the, the human dignity aspects of this are powerful. But for policymakers, at least where I come from, um, uh, it's a lot more powerful to talk about stopping crime and they'd much rather put people away for a long time than, than, what, than let one uh, um, uh, innocent person go to jail. And, um, uh, or, or one guilty person go free, excuse me. And I, I was wondering whether there is, you know, um, uh, whether studies have indeed been done to document the impact on society in ways that not just we care about, but that they care about, um, uh, in terms of the benefits to um, uh, to, to the economy, but, uh, the, the drain on the resources of the economy um, by, by over-incarcerating large numbers of people, by failing to provide for rehabilitation services, et cetera. And, and is that quantifiable, and has it been done, and are, are there plans to do more of that? And then, Thank you. Um, my name is Clifford Musicia, representing Public Advisory Service Institute. Um, listening to all the presentations, I, I think we need to understand that I mean, the enemies of what we are trying to achieve, or I mean, to be in line with I mean, the principles and guidelines as adopted by the UN, uh, are the low-minded lawyers. I think it's high time we needed justice-minded lawyers. Because um, who said anybody who is caught up in the uh, criminal justice system, he or she needs legal representation? That is not true. There are, there are several things that can be done for him or her to access justice. If we have that understanding, then, I mean, um, the lawyers who understand that they have several stakeholders who can come in to make sure that we meet the demand of providing um, legal aid services. Thank you. Um, now, JP, Legal Aid South Africa. Uh, I just wanted to tap on to a question that was raised uh, that side. I don't think it's been answered about roadblocks that may be raised towards the formulation of legislation that establishes legal aid schemes or legal aid uh, institutions in any country. And I would like uh, the panelists, uh, I know Professor McQuaid Mason may have had experience of this, of countries who had nothing but who now have this legislation in place. Because uh, it, it's one of the biggest problems we encounter in this country when we host country delegations, that they don't have anything to stand on in their countries. So those countries that have gone that path, can they share with the House what they did to ensure that they have this legislation come up and that which leads to, to legal aid institutions being established in their country? Thank you. Okay, are there any more questions or comments? One here. And then I'm just gonna take two more. So that's one and there's one there. And okay, three. And then I'm going to ask the panelists to also respond and then add one or two closing comments and then we must finish by 3.30 to hand over to the next session. Yes, thank you. My question is to Professor David. I just want to have his opinion. <laughs> you know, I come from a small jurisdiction, uh, 1.2 million inhabitants. We have around 600 lawyers. And our law of legal aid is dated 1970s, amended on different occasions, 73, 79, in the 90s, and lately in 2012. Uh, my question is, uh, do we really need to have an independent body uh, uh, established in regard to the granting of legal aid? Because Mauritius being a small country, uh, in my in a small jurisdiction like in the magistrate court in criminal cases, normally when somebody is arrested, the police inform the suspect of his right, and he's brought to court within 24 hours, and he, may, he, will, may, he will be informed, and he will ask the magistrate to appoint a, a lawyer to assist him in giving his statement. And then uh, this applies also for his bail application, and then for the trial also. 
And with regard to cases of murder, it will go directly before the judge. He will make his application. And in civil matter, it's the same thing. And if somebody is uh, making an appeal against the judgment of the magistrate to the Supreme Court, he make an application on the day of the judgment itself. Therefore, my question is, being coming from a small jurisdiction, is, it an, is there a need for an independent authority? Or, because I see it's working well and uh, with uh, little resources. So thank you. Okay. Who are the other hands? Just one day. Ed one, and then Ed and then Ed. Okay, yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Ed Cape. I'm a professor of law at the University of the West of England in the uh, United Kingdom. And in fact, I have a comment which picks up on the, the last question that was made. And uh, it was wanting to reinforce the need for the body that has responsibility for legal aid to be independent of government, which is a point that uh, Zaza Namaratza has made and is also in the principles and guidelines. And um, by way of reinforcing the need for that, I'll just tell you very quickly about what's happened in my own country, in England, England and Wales, because we, we did have uh, a legal services commission which, although appointed by government, had independence. And that was abolished about 18 months ago and replaced by a legal aid agency, which is part of the Ministry of Justice. And in that process, the, the Legal Aid Authority has lost any commitment to improving access to justice. And I was very interested just to compare uh, Legal Aid South Africa's values with the Legal Aid, Authority, Legal aid Agency's um, strategic objectives uh, in my own country. And I was struck by the fact that uh, Legal Aid South Africa says that one of its values is that it is passionate about justice. So I thought I would compare it and have a look at my own Legal Aid Agency, which as I say is now uh, run by civil servants as part of the Ministry of Justice. And they only mention justice once in their strategic objectives. And they merely say that they wish to contribute to wider justice. But I'm not sure what wider justice might mean. And as another of their strategic objectives is to simply implement government policy. Well, government policy in my country now is, has no commitment to access to justice and is simply to cut the legal aid bill. Uh, and so we see the, the very adverse consequences of having administration of legal aid simply run from within the Ministry of Justice. So I uh, would support the idea that uh, the body that has responsibility must have some independence from government if it's going to do its job properly. Okay. Thank you. And oh, is the one here ready? Okay. If you can go while the mic is being handed. Yes. Uh, uh, oh, I was just wondering because uh, uh, starting from the morning to now, what I understood of the principle of legal aid is it's all about uh, afford, uh, affordability, disability, and vulnerability. So based on these three factors, I just wanted to know what happens if a rich person becomes disabled? Will he or she be entitled to legal aid as part of the principle of legal aid? Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Domina Mbaku. <coughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, and I'm the Deputy Justice Minister of Namibia. I'm very happy to be here and then listen to some of the things that you have been uh, putting forward. Uh, but I think I have some two or three comments to make. <coughs> One of it is actually the, us listening too much to the lawyers. And I think there's a mistake there. When it comes to issues of policy, and we are listening too much to lawyers, lawyers are people who are very articulate, have a very good command of their language, but they are not policy makers. I always say that when you see people constructing bridges, you don't see lawyers there, because these are jobs for engineers. 
Why is it that you have to listen to the lawyers when you have to make policy? And lawyers, as organized as they are, we must make sure, we, we, we must distinguish that we are listening actually to the market. We are listening to commerce and we are listening to people who are chasing profit. And if we continue listening too much to them, they, it, it will end up actually being the dog that is being waged, the, the, the tail that is waging the dog, and not the other way around. So I'm, I'm one, actually, so don't think I have anything against that. <laughs> so I, uh, the other issue is that like, the philosophy and the system. We in Southern Africa, we have just attained our independence, and so are many of the African countries. But we have inherited systems that were not designed to save our society as they are today, but we worship those kind of systems without reforming them. And the actual legal aid problems that you are actually putting forward today here are simply a small problem of the wider problem. If we are not reforming the system as a whole, our effort will not mean much. So therefore, we must look as much as we can for allies and networks to actually make the impact necessary that we can make. Uh, so we must have the philosophy first, and we must decide the philosophy or the system to correspond to the philosophy that we want to make. When the professor from KwaZulu Natal was making the presentation, talking about uh, big cities, Actually, our law is literally for the elite. Our law is literally for the rural and for the urban, for the urbanite. Not so much for the guy in Kailisa or all these other places. This is the same thing that you can see of medicine. Many of the diseases that are prevalent in the first world actually have medicines for them. Whereas the problems that have, are actually obtaining and the crime that are obtaining in rural areas, we don't have even typified, criminalized conduct for this kind of uh, crime that are obtaining there. So we must actually ask ourselves as to what is going on. So my last recommendation is really for us to revise the curricula, even how we train our lawyers. Because they will continue thinking the way they have been thinking, and we will not make much of the difference. The curricula must be revised so that we produce new professionals that are thinking differently and informed by a different philosophy and approach to issues. So my last recommendation is really for the outcome of this conference to be shared with parliamentarians and be, to be tabled in parliament so that we can give you the backing necessary in order for you to go forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, I'm just gonna have a very brief comment, okay? And then I can ask the panelists, please also, can you just respond briefly because we do need to hand over to the next session. So just a very brief comment and then. Madam, merci. Je me donne la parole. Maro Amadou, ministre de la Justice de la République du Niger. Madam, je voudrais vraiment que les intervenants essaient quand même de donner leur réponse par rapport à certaines problématiques qui sont posées. J'insiste pour qu'il donne, notamment le professeur Davis, la réponse sur comment briser la résistance des avocats. Ça, c'est ce que souvent, que le dernier panel, moi, ma question a été contournée, n'a pas reçu la réponse qu'il qu qu fallait. Et, mais mon commentaire pour un, un pays comme le nôtre, et demain j'interviendrai sur l'expérience du Niger. Alors, on a adopté une loi conforme aux principes des Nations Unies, l'agence existe, elle est indépendante. Mais, moi je ne suis pas tout à fait sûr que en faisant de l'autonomie, de l'indépendance, une obsession que nous avançons. Ça, ce sont mes commentaires. C'est que, pour être sûr que ce mécanisme-là va fonctionner, il nous faut des gouvernements démocratiques et qui ont une grande conscience de l'égalité de tous devant la loi, du respect des droits humains. 
puisque l'indépendance pour indépendance, si l'agence n'a pas les ressources financières qu'il faut, ce n'est pas parce qu'on l'a écrit dans une loi qu'elle est autonome ou indépendante. C'est ce commentaire que je voulais faire. Ce dont nous avons besoin, c'est des ressources financières importantes que le gouvernement accepte et que l'Assemblée nationale accepte parce que les gens ont foi dans la lutte contre l'arbitraire comme ils en ont foi dans la lutte contre la famille ou les malades. C'est pour ça que, pour ma part, je pense qu'il faut des mécanismes de sensibilisation des gouvernements au-delà de cette question d'autonomie et d'adopter aussi, pour terminer, je crois, un système d'évaluation des pays comme dans le système de Commission nationale des droits humains où il y a statut A, il y a statut B. Je pense que c'est quelque chose qui encourage les pays, les gouvernements, ce système de notation-là pour avancer et sur ce chemin-là qui est un chemin tout à fait nouveau. Je vous remercie. Merci. 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 Thank you for all your comments. I think they are all useful, and I'm sure there are more. But unfortunately, we're running out of time. You'll also have an opportunity to raise the, the, the issues with the panelists when you meet them over tea or dinner. But maybe we can start with you, Zaza. Okay, this fight uh, will be very quick. Uh, on, um, uh, there was a previous comment on uh, recognition of paralegals, and uh, I mean, uh, I, I think uh, you know, the, in, a, in, a, in the last several years, there has been a growing recognition of role of par paralegals. You're only on Legal Aid Act, which was adopted in 2011, uh, recognizes uh, officially recognizes paralegals as providers of legal aid services and mandates paralegals to be stationed in each of them. It took about two to three years of very stiff resistance and then you know, efforts to counter the opposition of the bar and then uh, civil society efforts combined with the governments and judiciary here, I think, prevailed, fortunately. Uh, Indonesia, another country which also adopted a law very recently, also recognizing paralegals and are now currently elaborating the standards for accreditation and funding of paralegals. Indonesia, the, the Legal Aid Management Authority also funds university law clinics as providers of legal aid services, so they receive money from the legal aid budget. Uh, and as I understand, in South Africa as well, which has one of the oldest history of paralegalism, there are opportunities, there are kind of considerations of really giving them a full-fledged recognition in the bill, and hopefully they will succeed. I know the, about the efforts of paralegal associations here in this regard. On, um, on, uh, on costs, uh, benefits, or documentation, uh, on, on, uh, on the cost of detention, or the cost of not providing legal aid, so there, are, uh, we, there is a, uh, the report here provided uh, on uh, uh, socioeconomic impact of pretrial detention, which really goes into detail of documenting this matter. Uh, there are other reports uh, that I think may be available here as well, socioeconomic impacts or public health impacts uh, of, uh, of pretrial detention. And a colleague of mine, uh, Martin Shontich, will be speaking on this matter uh, at one of the parallel sessions, I think, tomorrow. But some fairly good, good studies, I think a good effort has been undertaken to measure the cost, not only direct cost to the, the detainees and their families, but the cost to the state and cost to the society. There's a really in-depth study on that on Mexico, and so I really encourage Martin maybe to, at some point, to share the reports and then speak to you about that. Uh, um, you know, the, uh, you know, what Clifford said is very much connects to the, the, the last uh, comment about the bar and then low-minded lawyers or opposition. In, I, you know, in any country, you know, I, I worked with Sierra Leoneans, I worked with Sierra Leoneans, uh, in Eastern Europe, almost I never came across the, I never had experience of the bar really teaming up or really trying to really work together with reformists. To, to push for the reform. So the reform, degree to which the reform succeeded for me has been degree to which the government champion for the reform succeeded in breaking the back of the bar or prevailing. It, that unfortunately has been the experience. On the other hand, I think I hope there has been that the, the reform really gives almost birth to the development of the criminal defense bar. So different kind of bars where profession is, in, is growing that is committed to indigent defense. This does not exist now, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, okay, I'll end here. Chair, uh, one of the questions that was posed again dealt with the question of, do we have sufficient studies to indicate in, in monetary terms why legal aid is a good thing? Uh, I've not 
uh, aware of, of exhaustive studies, but uh, one of our colleagues from Brazil indicated that they were busy doing something like that. So I think it is important for us to be able to make out the argument, not only on uh, a moral basis, but on all the other aspects that underlie this, uh, that it's important to, to have a proper functioning legal aid system. Uh, I was privileged to be one of the drafters of the South African Constitution, and very often I must hear people saying to me, you created a Bill of Rights uh, which favors the criminals, and I don't want to spend extra taxpayers' money on defending criminals. Now, apart from the fact that they are alleged criminals, uh, the point is, again, we must make out uh, an argument that legal aid in, it, in, in itself benefits society as a whole. And there are many good positive aspects to the taxpayer funding legal aid. And I hope all of us can go back into our, our different uh, jurisdictions to do that. And as we heard, uh, even in the most developed countries, there are problems with legal aid. Funding simply is not a number one priority. And adding on to the question of independence, I think independence is not an absolute, but it helps in focusing the mind on properly funding legal aid. So uh, we, we cannot only rely on the good people, we must also force the bad people to make sure that legal aid happens. Thank you. Thank you for the very interesting questions and lovely comments, and I suppose. I'd like to make a few comments on just two matters. The first matter was said that the legal aid lawyers, they need to be justice-minded. I cannot agree more to this concept. That's why I draw a reference that legal aid lawyers need not only have justice, but in my country, there's a certain law called the Myanmar Laws Act. And there's an analogy there that draws that. I draw a concept from there, that legal aid lawyers must not only have justice in their minds, they must also have equity and good conscience added with the human face or in other words compassion if you have compassion it carries you all the way and i think it means more to a legal aid lawyer than to a professional lawyer that is exactly what i've discovered when i'm faced with the poor and needy when i was doing my top briefs as a junior lawyer and that's why Compassion and human face with equality and good conscience should be added to this noble concept. Another matter is, uh, again, a very good comment, if I may say so. What happens if a man who is rich and suddenly he becomes poor and he can't afford a lawyer? What happens? Well, again, I draw strength from my earlier state that if that particular lawyer has compassion, together with the law, he will be able to carry this client all the way through. That is why, if I may say so here, well, it, I must draw analogy to another area of law, that is a commercial law. In the commercial law area, there's a certain aspect called the company law. In company law, as we all know, a certain person when he becomes very poor, he could be declared an insolvent. He could be a bankrupt. And in some countries, like Japan, they call a composition, which draws between the line between the insolvent and the common man. So if that be so, well, there's again, we discovered in our research that there are two tests that are applied. It's called the eligibility test in the English common law systems. And in some countries, the Far East, in Asia, we call the strict means test. That means he is tested as a criteria of his means. If he passes that test, well, if a rich man becomes an insolvent, he is a man, he is a common man, will he not be entitled to what an ordinary man gets? That is the answer. 
And I'm so glad that this morning, the question has been raised about the United Nations resolution on the subject matter. Because a couple of years ago, many years ago, I would say, about 30 years ago, 30 or 40 years ago, I was doing some research for my doctoral thesis at the University of Ghent in Belgium. It, the findings were that the matter of uh, the legal effects of the resolutions of the General Assembly, the General Assembly resolutions, they do not have legal effects. But in certain aspects, in public international law, if they do form a customary international law, then they become legally effective. Analogy. Well, Exhibit 1 is that the permanent sovereignty over natural resources is a resolution that has acclaimed wide acceptance of international justice. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shin. One minute. Okay. Just the first question about the getting um, the cost of not providing legal services. In fact, our politicians during our recent election said that they arranged for 30,000 prisoners to be released, which saved the country $3 million US. So there is information there. You can get it from prisons and so on. Um, Clifford's point. Clifford, I think there's an onus on the university to educate justice lawyers as well. And that's why you've got the Global Alliance for Justice Education, the clinical law movement, which us and others have been involved with. Um, Judge Malumba's point about raising the roadblocks, the biggest thing, and you mentioned this, Chair, is political will. We had political will in South Africa, they had political will in Afghanistan, they had political will in Sierra Leone. Those are countries where the presidents have taken the initiative to say they want to do this. How do you do it now? You've now got a fantastic tool, you've now got the United Nations principles and guidelines, which all your countries have signed up on, the whole lot of you, nobody voted against it. So, Niger, our French-speaking colleague, go back and tell your colleagues, look, you guys supported this, you supported it, this is what we've got to do. Um, the Mauritius story, I think Professor Cape uh, <coughs> mentioned that, but something, you might have all these wonderful systems, but does anybody monitor them? If you're going to have a coordinating body or a policy-making body, that should be an independent body, if you're going to do it that way. But you need somebody to monitor and check what, what is going on. Um, Affordability, the disabled example, the easy one is to say, is it in the interests of justice or not? If the guy's no longer got money and he's satisfied, it's in the interests of justice. If he has, it's not in the interests of justice, he can look after himself. Um, Namibia, again, you've got to consult all the stakeholders. You can't just put policy makers in there. You need to have everybody. You need the service providers, the lawyers, the paralegals. Even traditional guys, if they're doing traditional justice, you need as many people as possible in there. So lastly, again, to reiterate, if you want to remove those roadblocks, refer to these guidelines, refer to the manual, remind your governments they signed up on them, and it's their duty now to try and implement. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Can, we, uh, can you join me in thanking our panelists for all the presentations?